Thank you, Joe. I like the great person. <laughs> so what Joe's asked me to do is talk about an update in the maintenance uh, therapy of multiple myeloma. So this is sort of standard of care, and this is more uh, speaking to your practice. Uh, here are my disclosures, and because this is a debate style uh, um, uh, talk, what I thought I would do is talk to you a little bit about what the data is with uh, the role of maintenance in myeloma, really highlight the controversies because I do think we still have controversies, and finally address what we are trying to do with some of the future clinical trials which are ongoing because we certainly don't have all the answers uh, to some of the maintenance studies that we have. And the whole concept of trying to do maintenance studies is something which has been highlighted by the speakers ahead of me, and Jonathan did a really nice overview on how we treat newly diagnosed patients. And you all know that we use induction, we use transplant to consolidate patients. There are certain uh, situations where we further consolidate with some of these triplet regimens. And with that, what we are seeing is increasing a depth of response in these patients. And by so doing, we are delaying the relapses in these patients. And the idea of using or incorporating maintenance into the treatment of multiple myeloma is to further deepen that response. So you go from CR to stringent CR, and now even better. And by doing so, we are going to be delaying the progression of these patients. Thus, that is where we come up with the idea of maintenance treatment. And more recently now, we are looking at MRD as our endpoint in most of the studies. Uh, in multiple myeloma, and the idea of using MRD negativity again comes with the depth of response, so the deeper your response, and the more MRD negative you are, and the longer you stay MRD negative, the chances of you coming out of that response is delayed, so that we are really focusing on upfront treatment and trying to lengthen that duration of response in these patients going forward. So a lot of the trials that I will talk to towards the end are actually asking the question of how do you maintain this MRD negativity in our patients. So maintenance is not a new story in multiple myeloma. We started thinking about doing maintenance way back when we were using thalidomide. This is very old data now, more than 25 years old, wherein thalidomide was used by the IFM versus no thalidomide, and clearly there was a benefit to using an IMID even that early on in the treatment of multiple myeloma with both PFS as well as overall survival. The Australians then did a study where they com uh, compared thalidomide prednisone to prednisone alone, again showing an overall survival benefit as well as a progression-free survival. And finally, the Americans did this trial looking at thalidomide prednisone, this is Keith Stewart's trial, versus observation, and although there was a very significant benefit in terms of progression-free survival, there was no overall survival benefit, and part of the reason why this study actually did not become practice-changing was because of the toxicities associated with a drug like thalidomide, and we all know with thalidomide patients do get neuropathy, so the biggest thing with this trial was the fact that the quality of life of these patients was terrible, and one didn't want to put them on this treatment because of the progression-free survival. Well, over the last several years now, we have two big studies in the upfront setting. This is for the transplant eligible patients. This is the IFM study comparing lenalidomide to placebo. And clearly, lenalidomide doubled the progression-free survival of patients with uh, len maintenance versus placebo. Uh, what this study did not show was a difference in overall survival. This was followed by the famous CALGB study, and this CALGB study, again, very similar design and close to the same number of patients, 450-odd patients, where lenalidomide doubled the progression-free survival compared to placebo. And this one, when we went back and looked at overall survival, again, granted that this was a post hoc analysis, there was some benefit in terms of overall survival also in this patient population. So despite the fact that we have these two kind of seminal studies in myeloma, you know, there are questions, and the questions around maintenance is, what about toxicity? 
What about the transplant ineligible patient population? And the concern, and there are a lot of patients who don't necessarily use maintenance the way we should be using it up until progression is, are we breeding resistance? And that's a concern for patients, for clinicians as well, and what is the duration of treatment? And to try and address some of these, you know, this myeloma 11 trial is actually a really nice trial from this standpoint where it does get to some of these. So I am going to show you some data here. And I don't think the, it matters in terms of what they've had in terms of their initial therapy. But the big thing here was close to 50, more than 1,500 patients who were randomized to lenalidomide versus observation in this patient population. Again, we saw exactly the same thing that we've seen with all LEN maintenance studies, wherein you see a doubling of progression-free survival if you get lenalidomide. And what was nice about this study was it included both transplant eligible as well as ineligible patients. And again, clearly the benefits with the transplant eligible patients is much higher compared to that with the observation arm and compared to that with the transplant ineligible patient population. And one can argue about you know, what they used up front. They used mostly a psi rev based uh, containing regimen, which we don't use uh, in uh, the United States. But nonetheless, again, this is the first study in the randomized way showing that whether you're a transplant eligible patient or not, you should in fact be getting uh, lenalidomide maintenance. The other thing which is also highlighted in this uh, MRC uh, 11 trial is the fact that depth of response can take time. And if you look at the curves here, the um, uh, lighter blue uh, survival uh, uh, depth of response, you see most of the responses happen up to about six months, but you're seeing deepening of the responses way out as late as you know three and four years as well, suggesting that continuing treatment um, in the maintenance arm is important in this patient population. Again, the question then is, are there certain subsets of patients who would benefit from maintenance, or should you be using maintenance in everybody? And what they have done in this trial, again, is uh, defined uh, cytogenetic risk. And if you look at the curves here, it looks like a busy slide, but the bottom line is, the folks who got maintenance, whether they had high-risk cytogenetic features, which is the typical 414, 1416, deletion 17P, you did much better with maintenance compared to those who didn't. Obviously, the standard risk patients did a whole lot better. So the bottom line is, irrespective of risk, maintenance seems to help. The other question was, what about MRD negativity? And the question is, if you become MRD negative, can I consider stopping treatment? At least the data we have, and this is what we have as of today, if you're MRD negative, you actually do way better with continuing treatment with maintenance drugs as of right now. So MRD negative patients do much, much better. Again, underscoring the fact that the deeper your response is as we are, all we're doing is delaying relapse in this patient population. The other part which was quite nice about the study was although this was done in a very small subset of patients, so only 70 paired samples here, and what they looked at was the mutational profile of these uh, patients. And this is where I was speaking about are we breeding resistance by keeping patients on these drugs. So although this is a small number of patients, this is the only data that we have wherein they have looked at the mutational profile, and the mutational burden if you stay on lenalidomide does not increase, which is the bottom line. So you are in effect not genotypically making these patients any worse. And in fact, I think most of the data in myeloma will show you that your first treatment should be your best treatment, and you do need to continue on treatment, and you are not kind of genetically making them more aggressive so that salvage treatment will be difficult. I do not think you should be waiting for salvage treatment, and you should be giving your best treatment up front, and this is highlighted 
uh, by this data from the MRC. This is again the same wherein they looked at copy number variants at the time of presentation and at the time of relapse and looked to see whether the high risk patient population increases with giving patients lenalidomide maintenance and you clearly don't see that the patients do not become more high risk if they end up with maintenance. The other question, and I think this is still a question, but there is some hint of an answer here, as is to duration of treatment. How long do you treat patients on maintenance? And I will say that we do not have any data, but if you look at the MRC trial here, patients who were able to stay on drug the longest tended to do better. One can argue and say that this is a selection bias. The ones who stay well remain on drug for long, and those are the ones who do better. So I do think we, you will see towards the end that we are trying to address this question as well. But as of today, if your patient can tolerate maintenance lenalidomide, the answer here would be stay on maintenance lenalidomide as long as they can tolerate it, as long as there's no toxicity, because those are the patients who are actually going to do quite well from this. And this is again highlighted with the fact, I showed you the data on how long it takes for uh, the depth of response to increase. And again, this was looked at quite nicely in this MRC9 trial, wherein your tumor burden continues to decrease and continues to decrease as way down as 18 months into this treatment. So you are continuing to deepen responses, again, highlighting the fact that longer you stay on maintenance, the better it is going to be. So obviously, you know, because there was concerns around one study showing overall survival benefit, the other not, especially with the CLGB Alliance study and the IFM data, not a lot of people were convinced because most people say for maintenance studies, you should be seeing an overall survival benefit. I think there were a lot of problems with those studies in terms of what kind of salvage treatment you have in different parts of the world, et cetera. But Phil McCarthy did this meta-analysis of over a thousand patients, and we look at the meta-analysis here, what you see at a follow-up of 80 months when you take all patients included is a 26% reduction in risk of death, which is at least a two and a half year increase in your overall survival. So this to me is quite substantial, and this to me actually highlights the fact that you should be putting patients on maintenance treatment in myeloma. Obviously, with everything we do in medicine comes a little bit of a risk, and if you look at the risk here for second primary cancers, both hematologic and solid tumors, it is not zero, but it is not, it's about 3% or so, uh, whichever way you look at, but if you don't put your patients on maintenance, the risk of relapse from multiple myeloma is 70 to 80%, so most of us would argue and say that they should be on maintenance treatment. So what do we know thus far? We know that there is a progression-free survival benefit. We know that there's an overall survival benefit. Granted, it was in a meta-analysis. There are certain toxicities associated. And with everything we've seen to date, we know that most patients, in fact, all patients, do benefit from some form of maintenance. What is unclear still is which is the best agent. So far, all the data is with lenalidomide. I'm going to show you some data with exazomide as well, and we're still not clear, despite the data that I've shown you on the longer you stay on treatment, the better. We still don't know what duration of treatment here is. So there is data with the proteasome inhibitors as well, and this is the HOVON trial, which was a randomized trial wherein thalidomide was compared to, it's not so much a maintenance trial because all of these were getting treated with a bortezomib containing regimen. But the bottom line here was patients who got bortezomib had an overall survival benefit as well. And it was specifically highlighted in the high risk patient population where deletion 17P patients actually benefited from continuing bortezomib maintenance for beyond two years, wherein an overall survival advantage was seen in this patient population as well. 
These are a bunch of different studies, again, highlighting the use of bortezomib as a maintenance or as a continuous strategy in the treatment of myeloma, and all of them have either shown a PFS and an overall survival benefit. Most of them have certainly shown a PFS benefit, again, highlighting or underscoring the fact that you can use proteasome inhibitors, and at least in the high-risk patient population, most of us would consider using this. So we do have consensus recommendations with come from the National Myeloma Working Group, and there's data with thalidomide. We don't use thalidomide because of the long-term toxicity, and that's mostly neuropathy. I think lenalidomide has been acknowledged as sort of the standard of care maintenance treatment, and in certain situations, there is data with bortezomib, and at least in the high-risk patient population, we would consider using that. And this largely comes from data from uh, our colleagues at Emory, wherein they have used used in uh, high-risk patient populations, the combination of lenalidomide and bortezomib, and I don't think I've seen better data when it comes to the high-risk patient population. So although this is phase two data, most of us have adopted this in practice so that if you have patients with 414, uh, 1416, and deletion 17P, we will use lenalidomide in combination with a proteasome inhibitor for maintaining them in remission. I just want to uh, say a few words on the transplant ineligible patient population. We typically don't call it maintenance tra uh, treatment, but it is in general continuous therapy, and there's more and more data to show that continuous therapy compared to fixed duration therapy, in fact, benefits in terms of overall survival. And this has been highlighted by a meta-analysis done by Antonio Palumbo, and he's looked at PFS too. Again, the same notion here. If I treat them continuously, I'm not going to be able to salvage them, and I'm going to impact my second progression-free survival. I would not worry about that second uh, progression-free survival. And Antonio very nicely in this meta-analysis showed that whether you had continuous therapy or fixed duration therapy, your salvage treatment was not impacted and you do just as well, again, underscoring the fact that these patients need to be on continuous therapy, which is, in fact, some form of maintenance treatment in uh, multiple myeloma. Last but not the least, we now have a new drug in the maintenance setting, and this is an oral proteasome inhibitor. We've all used bortezomib, but all of us know what the uh, limitations of using a bortezomib-based strategy is, and that's largely over time. You know, first of all, you have to come into the hospital uh, to get that subcutaneous shot, and although subcutaneous bortezomib has mitigated uh, neuropathy considerably, the neuropathy is still a dose-limiting toxicity. So you have the Tumulin-3 trial, which was presented and is now published, um, and the data with that, this was the design of the trial, wherein these were, again, post-transplant patients who were randomized to uh, exazomib, given the classic way, uh, on a weekly basis, an oral regimen, very convenient, extremely well-tolerated regimen compared to placebo. And what this trial showed was a progression-free uh, survival benefit of about close to 40% in patients who were getting exazomib versus uh, uh, placebo. So I think uh, from a maintenance standpoint, most of us uh, would conclude that Revlimid should be uh, a maintenance standard of care uh, treatment. Where does exazomib fit in the pi uh, into the picture? I think the trial here was ICSA versus placebo, which is a little bit of a problem. We do have trial. It should have been compared to lenalidomide or combined with lenalidomide. Nonetheless, there is data with bortezomib, and in my mind, exazomib is a better proteasome inhibitor from a maintenance standpoint. It checks off all the boxes for a maintenance drug. It's oral, no neuropathy, can be given for years and years and years. And what about monoclonal antibodies? And you've seen some data in the upfront setting with the Alcioni trial and the Maya trial, where DARA has been continued for a prolonged period of time, which is translated into very nice progression-free survival. 
Unanswered questions here are duration of therapy and risk-adapted approach in these patients. And to address this, we are doing a few trials. I'm just going to show you what this is. This is a trial which is an ECOG trial, SWOG trial, which has been led by Shaji Kumar. And what he's asking out here is the duration of maintenance treatment. So do you continue treatment till progression, or do you continue it for two years? And there's MRD testing here. So two years with MRD testing versus forever Revlimid maintenance, because most of us who take care of our patients, we do see lenalidomide fatigue after a certain time as well. So this uh, trial will hopefully answer that. Another trial which Shaji is running is the Optimum trial, which I think is a very timely trial, wherein we are using MRD as an assessment tool to try and better tailor how we would use uh, uh, maintenance treatment. Here, patients are going to have had uh, treatment post-transplant for about 12 months, and what they are going to be doing is being randomized to getting lenalidomide versus lenalidomide uh, plus exazomib, so a really good place for exazomib to try and figure out where uh, we would be uh, using it, and this is using MRD to put patients on a doublet versus not. MRD negative patients, after a year of lenalidomide, we're going to try and take them off and see what the outcome there is. So again, an MRD directed strategy looking at either escalating or de-escalating maintenance treatment, and we'll see what the answer here is. Finally, there is this other interesting trial wherein the SWOG is looking at the use of deratumumab in combination with lenalidomide, again with an MRD endpoint and an overall survival endpoint, asking the question of adding more with an MRD endpoint. Is that going to make a difference in the outcome of our patients? So with that, I'm going to stop here, and I thank you for your attention.